Hello third graders. I'm here to read to you from pages 70 to 74 of your wild robot story. I think this time and the next time and we'll be finished with the story. So sit back and relax as I read to you from the wild robot. While his flock distracted the Reckos, Bright Bill darted around behind them, desperately searching for buttons. He had once shut down his own mother with a click, and now he would do the same thing to the intruders. But he found no buttons on these robots, only smooth surfaces. Clearly, the Reckos were not designed to be shut down so easily. Giant hands swung through the air, and the geese were swatted away. Loudwing was plucked by her foot and flung to the ground. She crawled into the weeds as the others scrambled up and over the trees. A quick scan by the robots revealed that Roz was gone. The three Reckos turned and marched back to the airship. The door hummed open and the robots disappeared inside. And when they stepped back into the meadow, each was holding a silver, silver rifle in their hands. The hunt for Roz was on. Without speaking, the Reckos marched away from one another, fanning out their standard search party. Party. Racco one marched straight toward the southern tip of the island. Racco two marched straight up to the mountainside, and Racco three marched straight into the forest. The next chapter is titled "The Forest Assault." Racco three marched through the forest with a steady, stomping strides. His blocky head swerved from side to side, scanning for any sign of Roz. But he was distracted. You see. Everywhere the Reco went, he was met by shrieking animals he didn't know, but he was in the midst of a coordinated assault. Swooper hooted orders from above. Hawks, sparrows, owls dive in front of his eyes. F Fink barked orders from below. Hares, weasels, foxes dashed between his legs. The forest was seething with an army of wild animals distracting the robot luring the terrible thing deeper into their trap. Chit Chat leaped out from the branches and clawed the robot's eyes, yelling, anyone who shows up on our island and tries to take my friend's mother away has a big problem with me. Then she leaped back into the branches. The robot pointed his rifle at the squirrel and pulled the trigger. A blazing beam of light shot out through the forest and sent tree limbs crashing to the ground. It grazed Poor Chit Chat, singeing the end of her tail, but she ignored the pain and scurried up to the safety of the canopy. With each stride, the ground grew a little softer and the robot sank a little deeper until he was up to his waist in thick, heavy muck. His churning legs showed, show, slowed to a stop and he stood there computing whether to move forward or back out. Rocco 3 was now an easy target. Begin the bombardment, ordered Swooper. The sky darkened as a swarm of birds descended from the treetops. They swooped past the robot and splattered his face with their droppings. Bird after bird swooped and splattered, and the Rocco's eyes were instantly caked in filth. Don't let up, screeched the owl. Do it everything, do it with everything you've got. There seemed to be an endless stream of birds with an endless stream of droppings. Rocco three let go of his weapon and wiped his filthy face with both hands. That was the moment that fuzzy bandits had been waiting for. They dashed out of the weeds, snatched the rifle with their nimble hands and dragged it away. Tawny and Crownfoot looked out, looked on from the underbush. The buck lowered his head and the raccoons carefully placed the rifle upon his antlers. Then the deer and the raccoon slipped into the shadows. By the time Rucko Three realized his weapon was missing, it was too late. He let out a sad electronic tone. And then as the birds continued their bombardment, the robot turned and blindly trudged back through the muck. It was now time for the final stage of the plan. Broadfoot, the bull moose, emerged from the trees and stood directly in the path of the blinded robot. Rucko Three had no idea that his every step brought him closer to the mighty animal. When the robot was in range, Broadfoot turned and kicked back with a powerful hind legs. There was a sharp crack and dung sprayed from Rucko's head. The moose kicked again, crack, and the robot's head flopped to one side. 
a tear in his neck exposed a tangle of silver tubes, but Reco Three's legs kept pumping to broad pumping so Broadfoot kept kicking. He pounded the robot's head with his heavy hooves, denning and crushing it into an ugly shape. And with one final crack, the head broke loose, soared through the air and stretched into the muck. The headless robot fizzled and smoked. His legs ground to a halt. He never moved again. Here's the destroyed enemy robot that was going after Raj. One of three. If you notice, we've got someone who here decided to join the party. This is Rudy. Chapter 72, The Mountain Rumble. Reco 2 stood at the mouth of the cave. Razum Unit 7134, are you in here? The only response was his own flat voice echoing back. But he sensed movement somewhere down the tunnel. So he switched on his headlights, raised his rifle, and marched inside. The Reco marched past animal bones, rock piles, and wide cracks in the walls. His blocky head swiveled from side to side, scanning for any sign of Roz. But she was nowhere to be found. So he turned and marched back toward daylight. And then a deafening roar filled the cave. From the shadows flew a giant body. Mother Bear charged into the robot and smashed him up against a wall. Then Nettle and Thorn jumped in, and together the family went to work. They rammed his legs. They slashed his chest. They muscled him to the ground. On his way down, Reco too squeezed the trigger. There was a flash of blazing light, and the walls began to crumble. Nettle grabbed her brother by the scuff and pulled him outside as an avalanche of rock thundered behind him. Mother Bear howled. The rifle exploded. Stones clanged against Reco too. The avalanche slowed and settled as a cloud of dust billowed for out from the cave. Mother! Nettle peered into the darkness. I'm here! I'm here! said the weak voice. The young bears dashed inside and found their mother half buried. They pulled heavy stones from her body and dusted her off. I have broken bones, she rasped, but I will heal. Where is the robot? Reco 2's headlights switched back on. Stones tumbled as the robot staggered to his feet. His body was scratched and scraped. His head was badly dented. His left arm was completely useless, so thwarp, it was tossed aside. Then one, the one-armed robot limped out of the cave and continued to hunt for Roz. Don't worry about me, Mother Bear growled to Nettle and Thorn. Kill that robot. With a heavy, with his heavy limp and his grinding gears, Reco Two was easy to track. The young bears caught up with him as he was entering a grove of pines, but they didn't attack. Not yet. There was a better place to finish him off. Up ahead. So they hung back and followed him across the mountainside. The distant rumble of the waterfall grew louder with each passing minute, and then a slash of white appeared through the trees. Soon the robot was standing beside the ro rolling, frothing, frothing river just above the falls. He was too badly damaged to leap over the falls or to wade through the rapids or to climb down the cliffs, but he had to continue his hunt for the target. So he started limping upriver in search of a safer crossing. There was a rustling and the young bears exploded out from the trees. They threw their heavy shoulders against the robot's body and he stumbled sideways onto the riverbank. Nettle reared up and wrestled the robot, twisting and shaking him with all of her strength. Reco too felt his feet slipping on the rocks. He felt his body tipping over and then he plunged into the white water and he brought Nettle with him. The current immediately swept Nettle toward the falls. She rolled through the rapids, crashed into one rock, and then desperately clambered onto another. Reco stood straight, and the river rushed around him. He took a step, slipped, and disappeared underneath the water. But then he was up again. Thorn ran to help his sister, but she was pointing up river and roaring, Use the logs! When the younger bear turned around, he saw what she meant. A jumble of broken logs were wedged between the rocks of the rapids, and a moment later, Thorn was on top of them. With water sloshing over his back, he forced a paw between the logs and pried the top one loose. It splashed into the river, 
and wound its way down through the rapids only to roll harmlessly past the robot. Then it dropped out of sight. The bear tried again. He popped another log into the river and this one spun just in time to ram its full weight into the robot's chest. Rucko too went sailing backwards and sank beneath the surface. When he reappeared, the river was full of heavy wooden torpedoes. One log pounded the robot's shoulder. Another slammed his face. More logs knocked him closer and closer to the falls. The current became too much for his, the injured robot, and it carried him away. He grasped for anything solid that he could cling to, but the rocks were too slippery. So he settled for a fistful of fur. Nettle had been hanging onto one rock this whole time, but now the robot was pulling her. She started losing her grip. She couldn't hang on much longer. Finally, she cried out, I'm sorry, Thorn, and she let go. Nettle and Rekko too surged toward the rumbling falls. The bear felt the robot release his grip. She watched him glide over the edge. Then she closed her eyes and waited for the end to come. But it was not Nettle's time. Reader, what happened next is hard to believe. You see, the river didn't fall away beneath Nettle. It tightened around her. Hundreds of fish surrounded the bear. They pressed their faces into her fur. They thrashed their tails against the current. And they slowly pushed her away from the edge. Farther and farther they went, gradually moving upriver. Until Nettle's brother pulled her from the water. The bears collapsed into the riverbank. And when they looked down, they saw hundreds of fish looking back up them. Thank you, roared Nettle. I'll never eat fish again. The fish smiled and sank into the rapids. I thought you were dead, said Thorn, breathing hard. So did I, Nettle laughed. Looks like you're stuck with me for a while longer, little brother. I'm not little. It felt good to joke, but the bears quickly turned serious. They were both bruised and bleeding, and their mother was in far worse condition. However, it would all be worthwhile if Reko too had finally been killed. The bears crept to the edge of the cliff, and there, at the bottom of the waterfall, strewn across wet rocks, was the shattered body of a dead robot. So they've got two dead robots. Remember, there's a third one. Reko one was standing in the great meadow. He stared up at the smoking hill of ash and then down at the stampede of footprints around him. There had been a large bonfire with hundreds of animals and one robot, but why? The Reko couldn't make any sense of what he was seeing. After thoroughly exploring the site, he continued through the meadow and into the forest. It was around that time that he lost communication with Reko 3 and then Reko 2, and he knew that his partners had both been destroyed. Reko 1 would have to hunt down the target by himself. The hunter marched on. His blocky head swiveled from side to side, scanning for any sign of Roz. He was soon gazing across the glassy surface of a beaver pond. On the far side, a thread of smoke drifted up from another of those wooden domes. With his powerful legs, the robot launched himself up through the air, roaring in a high, gra high, roaring in a high graceful arc over the pond and down to the other side. His heavy feet slammed into the ground, leaving deep craters in the garden by the dome. He hunched over and looked inside, fur and feathers and dying coals of the fire, but the target wasn't in there. The Rucko stood perfectly still and watched as a soft rain started dripping down through the tears of the forest. And then he sensed it. Up in the canopy was something that didn't belong. Roz had been spotted. The hunter watched his target drop from branch to branch down to the forest floor. Then she bounded away through the thickly tangled underbrush without stirring a leaf, without snapping a twig, and vanished into the green. However, Reko 1 had other means of tracking her. He would sense her electronic signal. The signal was gliding around the edge of the pond, but it was fading fast. A few more seconds and he would lose it entirely. Reko 1 burst into a sprint. The forest seemed to sway and quake from his stamping strides, and a minute later the forest really did begin to move. Trees were toppling down onto Reko. He fired his rifle, and two toppling trees turned to ash, and then a third swung down through the smoke and hammered his body into the ground. Reko one shoved the tree aside, pulled himself up, and continued to hunt. He didn't notice the beavers diving back into the pond. Reko one tore through the brambles and leaped over boulders, and suddenly the ground was caving beneath him. 
Down he fell into a deep pit, crashing against the bottom and twisting his legs. The robot violently pounded his leg back into shape. Then he launched himself up and out of the pit. He didn't notice the groundhogs watching him from their tunnels. The hunter faced one trap after another. He was pelted with flaming pine cones and stripped by taunt vines and crunched by tumbling rocks. The hunter now limped and rattled and was covered in scars, but he kept on going. Roz galloped back and forth across the island. Again and again, she tried to lose Rucko 1, but no matter how fast she ran or how well she hid or how many animals helped her, she couldn't escape the sound of the hunter's stomping footsteps. She had never run so hard for so long in her life. And while her mechanical body was holding up, her wooden foot was not. After hours of relentless pounding, it finally gave out. She was galloping through the rocky forest by the sea cliffs, when her foot splintered apart. As soon as Rucko 1 found the fresh wooden splinters, he knew his target was in trouble. He stomped out from the trees onto the clifftops and scanned the coastline. Below, geese were flying down through the drizzle. Otters were wriggling over the rocks. Seaweed was drifting, and broken robot parts were scattered about the shore. But the hunter also sensed a faint electronic signal. Roz was down there somewhere. The hunter's blocky hand clamped onto the cliff top, and then thwarp it detached, and the hand was connected to a strong cable that spooled out from the end of his arm. He gave the cable two quick tugs, and then it's, he stepped off the ledge. Racco one zipped down the cliffside, one arm releasing the cable, the other clutching his rifle, and he slowed to a gentle stop just as he reached the ground, and then high above the robot's hand unclamped, and followed the cable all the way down until thwarp, it snapped right back onto the end of the arm. Geese squawked and utter squeaked, and Rucko 1 marched through the robot's gravesite. The place was littered with torsos, limbs, and heads. They were all valuable parts, but he would collect them later. For now, his only concern was finding Roz. He followed the electronic signal over to a clump of seaweed, but there was was his target. But where was his target? Was Recco one sensor malfunctioning? The robot tapped his head a few times, but the mysterious signal remained. He looked around for any other signs of her, and as he did, the clump of seaweed reached up and grasped his rifle. Four robot hands were clamped around his rifle. Recco one loomed above. Roz lay below, camouflaged in seaweed. For a moment, all was still, and then the hunter suddenly lurched and twisted as he tried to rip the rifle away from his target, but Roz held on. Seaweed fell from her body, and as she was lifted right off the ground, her legs dangled in the air until she pounded her foot and stomped against the hunter's broad chest, leaned back, and pulled on the rifle with all her strength. Waves crashed as the robots grappled for the weapon, but Roz was no match for Recco 1. The hunter was too big, too brutal. Roz could feel her body being pulled apart, but she could also feel the rifle being pulled apart. A faint glow appeared between her hands. The glow grew brighter and brighter, and then the blinding explosion la launched the robots in opposite directions. When the smoke cleared, shards of rifle were everywhere. Recco One's body was pocket pocketed with holes, and one arm was charred and crippled. Roz's arms and legs had been co blown completely off, and she was now a torso and a head inside her computer brain. Our robot survival instincts were blaring. Her battered body simply could not take it anymore couldn't take any more damage. Clearly, Roz was not designed for such combat, but the Rekko was. He pulled himself to his feet and hobbled toward his target. Roz wanted to get up and run away, but without arms and legs, our robot couldn't move. She could only, she could only speak. Please do not deactivate me, she said. Rekko one ignored her. His blocky chest reached past her face and touched the back of her head. Click. Our robot was deactivated. And that takes care of those chapters through 74. I hope you're enjoying the story. Um, have a great day and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.